Well, bless the Lord. Today, our subject is, is there a statute of limitation on repentance? And this is a uh, subject a little bit off from what we would usually share about. But it's been coming up a lot in the news. And we were talking about it and Mac made a decision that um, based on some of the things we've heard, some of the comments that uh, we wanted to share our perspective. I, I can't say another because they have been different perspectives. So our perspective uh, about the statute of limitation, like you, you confess and what happens after that, especially when you're in leadership or in an organization, in the church, what, what's the statute of limitations? <laughs> um, God took me to 1 John uh, 1, and actually the verse was 9, but I want to read a little bit before that, because it's talking about, to me, my, my, my impression was about fellowship with him and one another, because that's what I don't, I'm not seeing in a lot of instances when someone um, confesses their sin publicly, there are different views on what should be done or why they did it and who, you know, especially if they're well-known. But we're in a fellowship. We should be in a fellowship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. And we should be in fellowship with one another. So there's, there's parameters in the Bible that tells us how we should act. So one of the scriptures that came up uh, for me, like I said, was 1 John. One nine, but I'm going to look at five. It says, this is the message. This is, of course, Paul. This is the message which we have heard from him, our Lord, and declare to you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say we that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And I could leave it right there because it says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful. He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And is that not the hope that when someone who confesses, we're talking about Christians, someone who confesses that he is a Christian or she and falls into sin but comes around and confesses it are they to be condemned are they to be ostracized are they to be put on a shelf or talked about if we're in fellowship with someone i would think the first thing that as jesus is an example he would pray for us as we would pray for others, as we should be praying for others, and looking to the Lord for guidance, because there's there's no, I don't think there's any literature that says you have to do this, and then two, three. I think every assembly, if there's leadership, and that there's sin in the leadership, which we're pretty much talking about, um, can make up their own rules. That's the freedom. We have in Christ. But are we making the rules based on man or are we basing it on Christ? I mean, David, we know his story, um, man after God's own heart. And he committed murder. Well, he committed adultery, 
then murder. And then he kept the sin to himself. He didn't confess it until Nathan, the prophet, put it in his face and he had to acknowledge that he had sinned. We don't know how long that took. He got he got Beth Bathsheba pregnant. The baby was already born. We don't know if the baby was anywhere from a month old to 12 months old. So some time had passed and he had not acknowledged his sin until Nathan came along and gave him an example of someone else's sin. It was a story. It wasn't true. And then David says, that person needs to be condemned for what they're doing. And, and Nathan said, you're the man. You're the one. And when he was confronted with that, he confessed. He didn't do it voluntarily on his own. It, it was an instance where God had to prompt him through somebody else. But David wrote Psalm 51, and he says, Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Is that, is that cleansing again? But who can do that? No one can do that but God. And at that point, Jesus wasn't on the scene, but we see it in 1 John. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But he knew that he needed, David knew he needed to be cleansed. That's the fourth thought. This is a man of God. Nobody can do this. He says, for I acknowledge my transgressions after someone came and put it in his face, but he did. And he says, my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned. And that's important because that's the person that he has actually sinned against more than others. From primary person is God. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So we have to we have to hear from God about the decisions we make if we have that position to make about someone who has confessed their sin. Are we going to God and asking him, how do we handle this? He's acknowledged his, his transgression, but are you going to base it on his, the murder? Are you going to base it on the adultery? Because I, I, I think we tend to do that, looking at what was the sin. It, he didn't say because I was an adulterer. He didn't say because I'm a, a murderer. He says, I have sinned. In Romans 3, even though this is basically talking about circumcision, but I, I like the idea of what, what the word says. Because they're making judgments in Romans 3 about being a Jew and being circumcised, being a part of the assembly, the way, but I'm a Jew, so I'm circumcised. So anyone that comes in that's not Jewish should be circumcised. So they're making a judgment about that. And they're, they're fighting over it. But it says down in 3, 4, it says that you may be justified in your words and may overcome when you are judged. Here we go, being judged, overcome. We look at being judged as like, you judged and that's that. But there's righteous judgment also. And you see the hope in that, that you may overcome. I don't hear that in some of the statements I've heard against some of these people that, are, that have sinned, that have confessed that they were Christians, have sinned and have confessed their sin. I don't see any, I don't see a whole lot of hope that they will overcome when they're judged. Not that they're not going to be judged because God's going to judge it's all of us. But the, the human judgment seems to be bereft. And that means there's a lack of what Mac was saying about the grace of God. It's like, 
Yeah, it's a big responsibility to be in leadership. But some of that responsibility is on, on those who follow because you, we, we need to remember that we are fighting against our own humanity in this war. And we need to be accountable one to another. But too many times we don't allow leadership to be anything but good. And no one is good but God. And when we, you know, say my pastor, my leader, no one can preach the word like he can. No one has that knowledge. That can affect you. That can affect who you are because you're hearing all this accolade. And no one is not susceptible to a lot of compliments. We all have to work with that. You know, we all have to understand that eh, that could be a trap. And you know, the enemy wants, he wants us to look bad. I mean, that's his job. Because, you know, when he, when, when um, the devil went up to see God about Job, he says, look at your servant Job. He is all this. He's a great representative in his community. He, everyone looks up to him. He makes good decisions. But you hurt him. You take those things away from him, and he's going to curse you. That's all the enemy wants is for us to look bad because he hates God first. And he will try to use anything he can to make us, his so-called followers, look bad. So we need to be aware of that. And we shouldn't participate in helping anyone to be big-headed, to, to look to their own selves because we've been giving them so many accolades. We have to be careful about that. We need to be praying for our leadership. And as a leader, they need to have people around that will not, or not always say yes, but say, you know, I'm concerned about this. I, I, I need to pray about this. Do you need someone to talk to? There are practical things that involve being a leader in, in, in any ministry or any any uh, uh Thing that represents Christ that is out front that people can see. A music leader, a Bible teacher, all those, they're in jeopardy. In Luke 15, 20 to 24, there's a beautiful story about the, the child who ran away and got all his money from his dad and just blew it in all kinds of debauchery and stupid stuff and wind up broke and living with the pigs. They say, you live with the pigs, but he actually lived with the pigs and ate their food. But when he recognized what was going on, he went back to his father, not knowing what his father would do. It's a picture of God. He was in a family. He was in a relationship. He was in a fellowship. He was in the family. That his father, his natural father, led. He was the head of it. So that father had a decision about how he would respond to this wayward son. And it says in, in 1520, and he arose, the father, no, the child, I'm sorry, the young man. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion. And ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. This young man understood he had sinned against God first and then against his father. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. Do you see that? Alive again. So somewhere before the time he left, he was walking in, in a way that was pleasing to his father. 
he was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. Wouldn't it be nice <laughs> to have that hope that when we fall and make a mistake, that we're not going to be beaten down, we're not going to curse that, we're not going to be, I don't mean curse, not necessarily with words, but with derision and attitude, that there's some hope. Why would you want to come back to a fellowship or a relationship where there's no hope. That's not Christ. Christ is our hope. The enemy doesn't give us hope. So who are we to be so hard sometimes? Galatians says, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore. Doesn't say beat them down. It says restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness. Considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. But if anyone thinks himself to be something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one examine his own work. And then he will have rejoicing in himself alone and not in another. Rejoicing. There's, there should be some rejoicing. When someone confesses, we should rejoice that they are acknowledging that their sin is first is against God. Godly repentance. Romans 15, 1. We then who are strong ought to bear with the scruples of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good, leading to edification. But even Christ did not please himself. But as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. Think about that. Christ took on everything that we ever did or ever will do. It fell on him. But whatever things were written before were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the Spirit might have hope. There we go again, hope. Now may the God of patience and comfort grant you to be like-minded towards one another, according to Christ Jesus, that you may be one mind and one mouth glorified the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. There are rules, there are regulations, there are standards. I'm not saying that's, that's not in, in order. But what about our heart towards those who have fallen? And we're not talking about, you know, the people who are saved. We're talking about people who are saved. How we, this fellowship, this family of God, the, uh, I'm going to speak Spanish, the Pueblo de Dios, which means the community of God. How do we respond? If we want people to be jealous of Christianity, we need to examine ourselves and the way we treat our own. Because none of us can say, it says, none of us can say that we have not sinned. We are not sinners in God's eyes. But we're not perfect yet. But we're less and less sinning as we grow in the grace of God. Why? Because when you love someone, you want to be the best you can be for them. We're overcoming a, a, a ancient of days of sin that came about because of Adam and Eve. But we are overcoming day by day by day because of the grace of God through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, and the gift of the Holy Spirit who tells us when we're tempted. No, but we have to make that decision of following that spirit or making mistakes and committing sins. It's life, but he has a better life. This is an exhortation for the body of Christ. We can do better. 
if someone sins and falls and is so condemned, why would they continue unless they understand the deepness of the sacrifice of Christ? Because that's what we have to look at. Not look at what people are saying, what people are uh, murmuring against us. We really need to understand because that is not, that's part of life. People are not always going to be kind. And we're talking about Christians. <laughs> They're not always going to be that forgiving. But when we understand the sacrifice of Christ and how he bore our sins forever, if that doesn't change your heart, change your walk, change your attitude, humble ourselves, nothing will because we have to take our eyes off of what others are doing and what others are saying and look at what the word of God says and make a decision not by the commentaries or as they call them the influences and we should not be influences for for negativity we should be influences for good because who is good God is good and his mercies endure forever and it's on that person who committed that sin it will help them to be restored in a way that they weren't before. Because maybe somebody didn't show this to them before. Maybe there were lessons they needed to learn. We don't know. God knows their heart. He knows what they're going to do. But he also knows what the outcome could be for this person and for others that they can influence. Because they have walked through that valley, the shadow of death. And they didn't have to fear anymore because they knew God was with them. Even in their darkest days, God was with them. And was he carrying a whip to beat them up? No. He was saying, you are mine no matter what. And if that doesn't humble you, if that doesn't make you feel repulsed from that sin, saying, oh, no, I don't want to go back there again because my father was walking alongside of me through the spirit in the midst of that and I am ashamed and I want to confess my sin. I don't want to live with this anymore. But that's a personal revelation for each one of us. But each one of us outside of that need to be cognizant of how we respond to those who are walking through those dark waters. That we give them hope. <laughs> because Christ is hope. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, Myra um, has hit on a portion of scripture that I'm also going to use. Uh, she went more in the descriptive uh, pattern as far as our subject um, talking about the exchange between uh, David and Nathan, the prophet. Um, I'm going to go to the actual passage in 2 Samuel that gives the actual detailed account. Now, she knows that she stepped right into Psalm 51, <laughs> which just happens to be the passage of Scripture that delivered me out of darkness into the marvelous light of Jesus Christ. Uh, that passage, I was that man. Uh, and um, we got to talk about why we are mentioning all of this. Now, I know that Myra gave the title. Um, the title of what we're doing here, or the theme, is Is There a Statute of Limitations on Repentance? And I'm going to come out and say it because I need for you all to understand where this came from. Because we were supposed to, in fact, this is the second week in a row we sidestepped a subject that, that we had in place to deal with something. And, and as she said in her opening, we don't normally get into topical uh, events and issues. Uh, that's normally something if I do it, I do it on my own. 
But this one is so important because it involves the entire community that at least claims to be of Christ. And we all know what's going on. Um, this is about basically the public admissions of sin from uh, Tony Evans and Robert Morris. Uh, I am not here today to say whether either is right or wrong. Um, I'm not here to make a proclamation that I actually know in the case of uh, Tony Evans, what that sin was. I'm not even here to have you guys judge why it took so long. And we don't even know how long is how long. Um, what touched us was the Christian reaction to both men. We know in the case of Robert Morris, the circumstances are different, and we know that there are harsh uh, penalties and consequences for doing anything of a sexual nature with someone who's underage. Again, I'm not the one to come on the airwaves and to pronounce judgment. God, God. God doesn't need my help in order to place a judgment. As Myra used David as the example, and it could be other Bible uh, heroes that all were flawed in some way or another outside of Jesus Christ himself. And I've got to go to my guy in particular, who's the Apostle Paul. I mean, Paul was an outright murderer and one who actually, his sin was to actually attack the very movement that Christ established in uh, calling it the way, or what we call Christianity now. And Paul was at the forefront, thinking that he was doing the right thing, but he's still at the forefront of torturing, imprisoning, and even murdering. Whether he did it by his own hand or had it done, he's accountable for those things, yet we elevate him to one of the loftiest spots in Bible history. And it just makes me ask the question, what is the statute of limitations on repentance when a man or woman makes a confession of their faith? Is it my responsibility to judge it? Is it my responsibility to call it out as a lie when I don't have any proof or documentation? That is a lie. When was it that we decided to be more holier than thou, being Christ, and to just know that a person is already convicted before everything comes out? Do I maybe, in my own personal way of thinking, have thoughts about either situation? Absolutely. But my public position is that may God's will be done. We don't know the circumstances. There have been allegations for both men of all kinds of things, but there's no uh, documentation in several instances concerning either one. And so when do we get to the place of actually allowing God's time to govern what we say or what we do with anyone. Now, you might call me being hypocritical because I have actually called certain people by name when it comes to the way that uh, they treat the word of God or the people of God. And the reason 
just to clarify is that there's a difference when there's an out and out blasphemy or an out and out misteaching of God's word where it would cause people to stumble and fall. I do feel like I must defend the faith and call out those who purposely, this is the key word, purposely put innocent bystanders in danger. And innocent bystanders are those that are not quite formed in their understanding of the word, those that are just getting started. You know, someone has to, you know, take the stand and look out for those who are still babies in Christ. Nothing wrong with being a baby in Christ. It's something wrong when people who are more mature don't call things out. But in these cases, there has been, at the very least, a public acknowledgement that there has been wrongdoing. And it has been done in our faces with media all around. And honestly, people that I listen to and respect, many of them have just come out and just put all types of opinions and all types of theories in place. Maybe they're right, maybe they're wrong. But until that stuff is true, why can't it be okay for a man to confess his faults and let God deal with it? And when did we stop praying for those who missed the mark and just start praying for those that are in need of prayer. Again, I, I don't know what the circumstances are. And I guarantee you, if anyone pulled the covers over our lives, there would be things that we wouldn't necessarily one exposed. There are things that we have done in our past that by today's standards would have all of us locked up. And at some point, we have to, first of all, in each case, if there are victims involved, pray for the victims, pray for their families, and pray for those who are the ones who inflict pain or or discomfort or humiliation. You know, even Jesus on the cross cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because even if a man or woman is clear in their head what they're doing and that is and what they're doing is for evil, that still doesn't mean that they're clear minded. And it still doesn't mean that God doesn't have a plan for them and a plan that's for the good of all of us. And so it disheartened me this week. And I I, I did. I, I, had, I said, Myra, we were going to do praise and worship. And I said, Myra, I can't do it. Myra, we got to step out here and we got to talk about this. So um, when I sent this lesson out as an event earlier this week, um, I posed three questions. I wrote them down because I put these questions out then I forget the questions I'm asking, mm -hmm. but I thought it was important to, to, to put the questions out. And I would actually pray that you all might actually be strong enough in the comments to answer them. I'm looking at the comments on my phone. So I can see when you pop in. In fact, I can say, hello, Oju. I can, oh, nigga, uh, someone that I used to work with. Good to, to see you. Glad you're watching. So here are the three questions. Question number one, do we have a right in the Christian community to put a time limit on when and how a person repents? That's question number one. Question number two, putting blaspheming of the Holy Spirit aside, 
Are there any sins from whence there is no repentance? This is straight Bible, y'all. Okay. Number three, do men in leadership roles in our places of worship, are they held to a higher standard than the rest of us? And I'm hoping that in the little bit of time that I'm going to share before we just close this out, I'm hoping that in the scriptures that I bring up, that all of these three questions are addressed. I'm not going to tell you when I'm addressing them. I want you to really just listen with maybe an open ear to hear what God is saying to us. And then in your own way, uh, you know, come to a determination on how we who are the receivers of these confessions and and repentances, how we should respond. So again, Myra went there, but I'm going there again. Second Samuel, and yes, I must read the whole thing, uh, uh, verses one through 13. Everything that I'm reading is coming out of the New King James Bible. Okay, or the New King James Version. It says, well, you know, I got to set you up. She did, but let me just, just for purposes of uh, putting everything into context. We know that David was supposed to go out with the rest of the kings uh, at a time of battle. We know that David held back. And while David held back, which was being disobedient to God, we know that temptation came his way in the form of a woman on the rooftop baby. And we know that that's Bathsheba. We know that David did everything to maneuver himself into her presence to, as the Bible say, get to know her. We also know that her husband, Uriah, a faithful man unto David, if no one else, tried to set up Uriah to be in a drunken stupor, to have relationships with his wife when it was reported that Bathsheba was with child. David did everything to intoxicate the man. But Uriah, being a faithful man to his Lord, and his Lord in this case was David, he would refuse to participate in any activity that would cloud his mind or his judgment. And ultimately, when David failed to get him drunk so that at least he could have known his wife and they could have said the baby was Uriah's, instead, David did oh, something that was horrible, if you really think about it. He put Uriah in a position on the battlefield where he knew that Uriah would not return home. So not only did he set up an innocent man to be taken away from his wife, he knew David, that is, knew his wife, in other words, had intercourse with that wife, and now a child uh, has been formed in her womb. And that's, the, that's the, the setup for what I'm getting ready to read in 2 Samuel, because sometimes we have to have people that come into our lives and tell us about, you know what, about us. Sometimes we need to know about us. And this is what Nathan the prophet did. Now, Nathan went in there knowing that, hey, this may not work out right. That, you know, in those days, uh, anything going against the king could get you killed. So this is not just two buddies, and, and, and all of a sudden, one buddy gets real with the other one. This is a servant literally calling out his master through what I'm getting ready to read. So, 
2 Samuel 12, 1 through 13. Then the Lord sent Nathan to David, and he came to him and said to him, There were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and nourished, and it grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. And a traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd to prepare one for the wayfaring man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold, in other words, four times, for the lamb, because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Then David said, excuse me, then Nathan said to David, you are the man. Now I had fun with this the last time I, I read this. We're not talking about a particular pastor who uh, decided to say that even though he was having uh uh, relationships uh, that were not conducive to the scriptures, that he's still the man. Mm -hmm. This is Nathan saying to David, hey, hey, you are the man. Then this was not positive. Thus says the Lord God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, and you know that would be Saul, and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah, uh, or killed him. Yeah, you have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you, you from your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbors. And he shall lie with your wives and in the sight of this son as you in. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. So David said to Nathan, oh, oh, wait a minute. I think, Myra, here comes a, 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 a confession, right? David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord has put away your sin. You shall not die. Now, I'm going to cap it there uh, as far as that scripture is concerned. But think about this, beloveds. David, until he heard that account from Nathan, David had no intentions on admitting anything. And as Myra shared uh, earlier, we don't know how much time lapsed between uh, 
the the original sin and this exchange between the prophet and the king. We have to know that it came before the ninth month of Bathsheba's pregnancy. That's all we know. So what, what are we trying to, to say here that, you know, sometimes, and this is not the two men that we referenced at the top, but sometimes you need to be provoked in order to admit your wrongdoing. We don't know if David would have ever acknowledged that because it was done in secret. Nobody knew. Nobody knew. So why is it that we have commentary from people who say that they are believers in Christ. I see you, Pastor Larry. Why is it that whether we're talking about Tony Evans, whether we're talking about Robert Morris, or any other person who has come forward and admitted their sin, why are we getting involved in that? Why don't we trust the process that God has put in place? Why is it that we feel like somehow we have to make commentary on things and situations that we have no knowledge of? We weren't there. And what we don't understand is that every little comment about these two men and others like them has uh, has reputable damages to their families and to congregations that looked up to them. Again, I'm not here to make any kind of proclamation of anyone's innocence or guilt. That is not my call. But my call is as people of God to allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. And God has never, ever needed our help in placing judgment and uh, issuing out whatever the consequences are for any of our wrongdoing. I sat there this week, and as people were just making assumptions and going through all those motions, and I thought about, oh my gosh, if I had more notoriety publicly with the things that I have already confessed of my own life, my gosh, I guess I would be tarred and feathered. When those things were years ago, and the man who is making all of these hand gestures before you right now, it's not the same guy that I was 30 years ago. Do I know whether they're being forthright? I have no idea. It doesn't matter whether I know. It doesn't matter whether you know. What matters is let God have his way. I went to a passage of scripture, because it was in my heart as well. In Proverbs 28, 13, it says, he who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. So if these men, or if any man, any woman has made a confession, then why don't we just allow for time and God to deal with whether it's forthright? Because his word, according to Proverbs 28, says that he will have mercy. And in fact, 
Myra's so right. The reason why I did that song at the top of the hour, if not for grace, by the way, giving proper credit to the writer of that song, who is Clint Brown, one of my favorite songs ever. I remember when I heard that song and I was like, oh my goodness. It, it, it's a simple little song, but it's so powerful. And I wanted to use it today because where is the grace? Where is the mercy in the way that we're living today? I see over Facebook, over Twitter, or oh, excuse me, X, okay, <laughs> I see all of these exchanges going back and forth, not just Christian exchanges, but things dealing in politics, things dealing in social justice. And I'm going, when did the whole world just go mad? And when I say mad, I'm not just talking crazy, but just angry at everything. Nobody could live according to the standards of the other person. And immediately you go into cancel culture. The moment you say one thing that is not agreeable to anyone and families are affected, households sometimes are ruined because of misplaced judgment and a lack of mercy, a lack of grace. And this is what was happening in the story that Nathan was giving in 2 Samuel. Like, dude, you're rich, but you would take the poor man's little ewe lamb, as opposed to just giving of your own, which you have in abundance. All right, that's not so much about the men that have fallen into sin and made confession of it. That's about us on the sidelines, y'all. We were like David, off with him. He should die and, and four times whatever the value should be given back. That's what we're doing. This is not about those men. I promise you, I'm not beating those men up at all. I'm just using them contextually to make a greater point. Stop worrying about them, about you. Where are you at? Where are you at? I should have named it that. Where are you at? Because this is so important. Every person almost in the scriptures, there are accounts where they messed up. But these are people that we elevate today because they are mentioned in the book. If we can embrace murderers, liars, Thieves, whores. Oh my gosh, if we can actually elevate these people. I mean, a guy by the name of Peter denied Christ three times, right? Three times. But it's the same Peter that was an important part of the establishment of the new covenant as we know it today. But if we had gone with the sensibilities that are being used this week, none of these men would have been able to have anything accomplished because we would have rejected them immediately without the grace that God has given us through Jesus Christ. Man, okay, so let me go to one other passage of scripture. This is in Ephesians uh, chapter four. Uh, this is actually the last scripture um, that I'm gonna use today, but I broke it up. So we're gonna go Ephesians chapter four, verses 1 through 6, and then we're going to jump down to verses 25 through 32, and then we are out of here. All right, so 
This is what Ephesians 4 verses 1 through 6 says. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, this is Paul, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Hey, Jackie Farmer. With all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love. There is one body and one spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Reading that, does that give us license to just make outlandish statements about people we don't even know? No, no, this is my point. And, and if I'm a little animated, it's for that reason, because people who I respect, literally, I respect pe these people, we're just talking about what Mr. Evans and Mr. Morris were doing. And we don't have all of the details in either case. And let's say that everyone was correct in the assumptions. Is there anything too hard for God? God is a restorer to them who diligently seek him. Could this actually be, for both men, the beginning stage of a process to get things right with God, to reconcile into the household of faith in a better way? Do we know? Have we allowed enough time to pass? No. We just go out there and just slam people. Their families are affected. Their congregations are affected. And we're doing all of this without all of the details. Let me go on in Ephesians 4. Now I'm at verse 25. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. For we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another. Can I say that again? And be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. There's no better way to end this today. We have seen many instances of, of family members who have been murdered and we've seen it. All of you, you know you've seen it, where they get in the courtroom and sentence is placed by the, the letter of the law. And we've seen the families of the ones who have had to bury their loved ones actually show mercy, actually show grace, and pray for 
the eternal soul of the one who took away their loved one. That's a tall order, but that shows me way more about the power of the Holy Spirit than to sit around and make YouTube videos or go out uh, in congregations and talk ill of men who have, whether you like it or not, they have come forth and said, I'm guilty. I honestly don't know how the accusers can live with themselves. It's an emotional response that we are not allowed to have as believers of the faith. We can abhor what has been done. And in the case of one man, it is horrible, horrible. I am not justifying in any way anything related to pedophilia. But nevertheless, God, is powerful enough to even deliver the pedophile. And we have no right to sit around and make random conversation and there are no consequences for us. We have nothing to lose in the game. But the people who are at fault and the family members attached to them have a lifetime generationally to deal with the repercussions of angry, hateful people that I'm afraid I have to call Christians. I'm begging, pleading, hoping that this, first of all, address the three questions that I put out there. I think it did, but even more so that we would take the time to examine our own hearts before we publicly start just berating people who have come forward. No matter what means, they've come forward. They've come forward. Let God deal with it. Let God have his way. And may we pray for the individuals, for the victims if they're victims, and for the family. I'm scared to say it, but I'm going to say it next week. We'll deal with praise and worship <laughs> at last. But this had to come out. We praise God for each and every one of you. I'm not going to call people individually by name, but we so appreciate your attendance. And, you know, stay with us. Uh, we, we're praying that we have some great uh, topics that are coming down the line. And again, if there's something that you think that we could address, we'll do it to the glory of God and to the best of our abilities. And don't be afraid to disagree with us. Just make sure if you disagree with us, just come with an answer that qualifies why you disagree. Don't come with, oh, I just feel like. No, that, that's not what we're dealing with here. I didn't mention anything about my feelings and anything that I shared, neither did Myra. We're not worried about feelings. We're worried about being true to the Holy Bible and to our God and our Creator. We just want you all to know that when we come here, we come from a place of integrity, wanting to make sure that we are at our very best so that the word is proclaimed at its very best and that you, the listener, can be at your very best. May God bless and keep you in his perfect peace with our minds stayed on Jesus. God bless you. Bless.